Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Kate, and I'm going to talk about neon signs and why I think they're important. A little bit about my background so you know how I came to be Portland's neon evangelist. Um, I'm a graphic designer, super focused on typography and lettering. I lead neon tours of Portland six times a year. And I co-produce a festival called Neon Speaks, which takes place in San Francisco. So neon has been part of our urban landscape for more than 100 years. Here in the Pacific Northwest in December, the sun sets at 4.30 PM. So I dare say that neon is an essential feature of our urban environment. Neon signs provide brightness in the dark, which makes sidewalks safer. But there are many other reasons why neon is important, as you'll soon see. The science behind how neon signs work is very simple. What we call a neon sign is sometimes filled with argon, sorry, with neon gas, but there are four other gases that are used in these signs, argon, helium, krypton, and xenon. These are called noble gases, which means they are stable and don't react to being combined with other elements. Neon gas, gas in particular is rare on Earth, but abundant in space. Nebulas like this one here are made of dust, excited gas, heat, and ultraviolet light. This nebula, NGC 6153, has the highest nebular neon abundance known in the universe. Here on Earth, small amounts of these gases can be found leaking from volcanoes. Lightning is a phenomenon that acts much the same way that neon signs do. In fact, one of neon signs' nicknames is lightning in a bottle. Here, positive and negative charges occur in the cloud, which then connect to an opposite charge on the ground below, which excites the hydrogen in the air, which gives off photons, which emit light. I hope you can see this slide. I hope it's not too dark. Um, so in the neon sign, we have a vacuum sealed glass tube, which contains gas. There's a positive charge on one end, a negative charge on the other. The gases, molecules, ions, and electrons are excited by the charges and move toward each end at thousands of miles per second. The molecules collide and blast apart, emitting photons. In 1898, neon gas and the other noble gases were discovered by Scottish chemist Sir William Ramsey, who won a Nobel Prize in chemistry for this discovery. In 1902, a French engineer named Georges Claude built upon Ramsey's discovery to create the first neon sign, which he developed to become a commercially viable product. In 1912, Claude sold his first neon sign to a barbershop in Paris. So this is where neon had its debut and is one of the reasons Paris is called the City of Light. Georges Claude introduced neon to the US soon after, and once World War I was over, the neon trade spread across America very quickly. It became the newest, brightest way to advertise on the streetscape. You can see a neon sign from miles away. It was beautiful and appeared futuristic. After World War II, American soldiers returning home could use the GI Bill to enroll in neon trade school and learn how to bend glass and fabricate signs. And many of them sure did. Business was booming. And it was awesome. This was, <laughs> this was neon's peak between 1940 and 1960. But it went too far. The streets became so cluttered with neon signs that by the 1960s, a general distaste grew against neon, and it became associated with smut and dilapidation. In 1965, Lady Bird Johnson's Highway Beautification Act passed, and cities across the nation launched a Scrap Old Signs SOS initiative 
tens of thousands of neon signs were destroyed. At the same time, plastic was on the rise, which was much cheaper. So once plastic signs took hold, neon's popularity declined. However, the neon sign industry held on. And in the 1980s, neon art became popular. This is a piece by Bruce Nauman from 1985. And today, there are museums all over the world dedicated to neon signs, including one here in Oregon, the National Neon Sign Museum in the Dalles, which opened last year. There are many elements that go into the creation of making a neon sign, but at the heart of it is tube bending or glass bending. A tube bender, shit. There you go. A tube bender takes a length of straight glass tubing and uses flame to soften the glass, adding a puff of air to prevent the glass from collapsing on itself. Benders work atop paper patterns, matching the lines of the design as they bend. Neon signs are made essentially the same way today as they were in the 1920s. Neon sign making is a specialized, highly skilled craft that takes several years to master. There are families of neon benders that have passed the trade down through generations. This is Blanchett Neon in Edmonton, which is still operated today by the third generation of Blanchett descendants. Neon signs are actually a very green technology. All the parts of the sign, the glass, electrodes, transformers, wiring, and sheet metal are reusable, recyclable, and relatively non-toxic. At the time that neon signs were introduced, they were exponentially more efficient than incandescent bulbs and were marketed as a money saver due to the fraction of electricity it took to power the new signs. Today, LEDs have surpassed neon signs in efficiency, but LEDs are not yet a green technology, nor do they have the longevity or simplicity of neon, nor the beauty. <laughs> Portland is lucky to have a good quantity of vintage neon signs still in use all over town, and some real beauties. I'm going to talk about three historic signs in town and why they're irreplaceable works of art. Portland Outdoor Store opened in 1914. Their gorgeous neon sign was built in 1947. The lettering here is in a classic 1940s style. And one common feature of Portland vertical, many Portland vertical signs are these tapered stacked letters from top to bottom. See how the O is much bigger than the R. Another unique thing about this sign is its horse and rider design. There's so many beautiful details in there and lots of different color tubes. We've got red, pink, blue, white, and yellow. That's a lot. This sign reminds me that Portland is part of the West and of Western Americana's connection to nature, the landscape, and animals. This store is over 100 years old, still going strong, and I hope that this sign can remain at this location long after the store is gone. The Alibi is Portland's original tiki bar, opened in 1947. It's one of the oldest tiki bars in the country, uh, and much of the interior has remained unchanged for the last 70 years. Now this photo is from 1953, so this is an older sign. The sign up today that we're all familiar with was built around 1963. The bulbs used to be all white, but during a recent restoration, the bottom half of the bulbs were changed to red. Here it is in all its tiki glory. These angular letters are so unique. I can't think of any other sign in town that looks like this. And the word alibi has so many nefarious associations. To me, it's just 
this fun, mysterious dreamscape, which is so unusual on the streetscape today. There we go. There it is in action. It's a real dazzler. You should go visit it if you haven't seen it lately. <laughs> The Laurelhurst Theater opened in 1923. It was built in the Art Deco style by Walter Tibbetts, the same architect who built the Hollywood Theater. Again, we have this tapered lettering on the vertical sign, big on top and small on the bottom. If you have not seen this theater at night, please do yourself a favor and go see it. Photography does not capture the magic of this place. This luscious L is one of my favorite features. And also, this sort of plume of peacock feathers with multicolored tubes emanating like the sun's rays. It's just so unique and breathtaking. I actually think this is one of the best neon signs in the world. If you love neon signs, and hopefully now you do, <laughs> here are a few things you can do to encourage their preservation. Support the small businesses that keep these beauties lit. Tell the clerk or shop owner that they have a beautiful sign. Simple as that. If you see a sign coming down, find out what's happening to it. And if it's not spoken for, contract, contact security signs or another local sign shop and suggest that they take it into their possession. Another thing you can do is support our local neon vendors. There are a few full-time neon artists in Portland. You can help keep the trade going by ordering a custom sign for your living room or your office. It's worth examining why we all choose to live in or near a city. One of the reasons people are attracted to urban life is its strong connection to history. It's evidence of history. Old signs are a glowing signal from the past and make up an essential part of a vibrant, interesting place. Neon signs are all handmade and you can see the hand-shaped imperfections in each design. This is unique in our urban mass, mass manufactured environments. Neon connects us to the past, to independent business, into outer fucking space. <laughs> and it's just beautiful. So I co-founded a group called PDX Neon, and our mission is to raise awareness of Neon's irreplaceable cultural value and advocate for its protection. You can follow us on Facebook or and or follow Electric Letterland on Instagram. And I'm I'm going to be leading uh, three walking tours um, this fall. Come on a walking tour. They're really fun and ends at a bar. Thank you. Thank you.